Now, the dark god of the void in one of his earlier battles was felled along with a warrior of light on an unknown planet. There, the All Black left him for God the God Butcher, and then Null slowly managed to recover over the course of a century, and while stuck on Gore's planet, he began experimenting with his powers and discovered that he could manifest amorphous parasites called symbiotes from the living abyss and bond them to lesser life forms, corrupting life rather than eradicating it. But something unexpected happened. The symbiotes over time developed a survival instinct and began to evolve beyond Null's direct control. In a rebellion, they turned on Null, trapping him in a cage of their own collective bodies and forming what would become the prison planet called Glintar, a word meaning cage. The symbiotes in question are composed of the living abyss at their base. Kind of like how we are carbon-based organisms, they are living abyss organisms. So the living abyss is also called the anti-life, the black ichor or the necro power. It is an eldritch substance from the primordial cosmic void existing as a dark counterpart to life and light created by the celestials. Controlled by kings in black, it serves to maintain the multiverse from within. It is typically amorphous and comes primarily in black. It is described as coal with a motor oil-like taste and decaying smell. Sometimes feeling like latex or plastic. Created to corrupt and destroy, the living abyss gives power to life forms and is capable of killing gods and draining them of their power. Its parasitic nature allows it to infect and infest anything, from small life forms to even living planets like Ego and eventually if Null gets its way, the universe itself. The biology of a symbiote, particularly one like Venom, is a marvel of survival and adaptation. A strange mix of simplicity and specialized complexity that makes it a powerful force in any environment with the right host. At their base form, the symbiotes are nothing more than writhing black mass made out of the constituent matter of the living abyss. A multicellular assemblage of anti-life cells, of strange nutrient pathways and connective dark living abyss matter. They have never been seen to possess organs and in fact no complex internal structures to speak of just gooey, sentient mass of exotic matter of cells, with the physical appearance of something like a slime mold. However, their intelligence level is fairly high, capable of problem solving and complex responses, kinds of like the sophisticated processing one might see in higher organisms and even humans. In the old canon lore of Marvel, symbiotes could only live without a host within a limited amount of time, but that has changed over the years. Back in the day, symbiotes needed a host to survive, which gives them their name, symbiote, as a symbiotic organism that can only survive if bonded to another species. Kinda like a parasite but one that also gives back in return. Once bonded, the symbiote essentially borrows the host's body and also his cognitive capacities and communicates with it in a telephatic way. But it can also emerge out of the host as a slimy head with a rubbery stretchy neck and speak in the host's language. This bonding isn't just surface level connection, it goes deep into the cellular level, beginning a biological integration that enables the symbiote to share sensory information, thoughts and even DNA material or information and even emotions with the host. So these symbiotes have developed highly acute unique type of sensors that act as feelers to pick up on subtle environmental cues. These sensory structures are highly effective but extremely delicate with a surprising Achilles heel being a specific sound wave. A spectrum of precise sonic vibrations causes these sensors in their slimy body to go haywire, leaving the symbiote in pain and disoriented, often enough for it to detach from the host and be expelled in a panic that activates their fright and flight survival instinct. This vulnerability makes their separation from the host a highly stressful event, as the symbiote is exposed to all sorts of dangers it can't handle on its own. Without a host, a symbiote's chances for survival drops sharply, its physiology is fragile and dependent on resources that, without a steady supply, it can quickly be depleted. It can improvise in emergencies using its constituent matter cells to form temporary structures that let it crawl and move. However, this is taxing and it can't last long before energy stores are drained. When it eventually finds a suitable host, it immediately jumps and forcibly bonds with it with the bonding process seem to be intense, almost like an instantaneous merging that essentially turns the host's body into a symbiote-compatible environment. The symbiote-living abyss invades all the organs and tissues, 
linking itself with every cell and enables it to access critical parts like the brain, the bone marrow, blood vessels and even the liver and gut. This integration doesn't just enhance the symbiote's access to resources, it also shifts the host's metabolism into overdrive, with stem cells kicking into high gear and a symbiote feeding off chemicals like phenethylamine and adrenaline, the body's own feel-good or fight-or-flight compounds. These become the symbiote's fuel for sustaining its physical enhancements and healing, which were supposed to be stress hormones for the earlier iterations of this parasitic species. Under threat, the symbiote can generate a transformation in the host's body. This process creates a thick living abyss shell around the host, a sort of a highly durable slime armor built from layers of the dense dark constituent matter that can grow a normal human host, for example, to nearly 8 feet in height. This armor is robust enough to shrug off bullets and break concrete with ease. Not only is it durable, but it is also flexible, allowing the symbiote to grow long, whip-like tentacles from its skin that it can wield with surprising accuracy and strength. The symbiote's skin is particularly remarkable, seemingly appearing to be coated with a thin, oily secretion that keeps it moist for passive gas exchange. However, this is still just the appearance of the exotic constituent matter of the living abyss, and just might be that. When the danger passes, the armor or the shell, the living abyss shell that forms the body of the symbiote, is reabsorbed back into the body of the host. On a cellular level, the symbiote is attached to and even merges with individual cells, which means billions or even trillions of cells. It connects to the host's bloodstream and spreads by either engulfing or permeating through the spaces between the cells or even the atoms due to their unique dark abyss makeup. It can produce specific chemicals to enhance the host's physical abilities, boosting strength, speed and healing, which means it also produces proteins. Additionally, the symbiote can read and interact with the host's DNA, potentially altering it or drawing on it to better fit the host. And with this, the host's DNA and memories as well as cumulative knowledge, skills and genetic adaptations are molded into what is called a codex within the hive mind of the symbiotes. Over time, the codex becomes a vast repository of data, turning the symbiote into a repository of collective memory, of experience and power. With this, the host and the symbiote would continue to live on even after their physical bodies have been obliterated and sometimes allowing some of them to even be resurrected or reincarnated back. Symbiotes like Venom are also unique in their ability to communicate with hosts on an unexpectedly personal level. This connection isn't just a simple voice in the head, it becomes a true form of shared experience, with the symbiote adapting its own mental processes to align with the host. One of the most fascinating aspects of symbiote biology is their communication network, which operates in ways more advanced than any human system or artificial system. Symbiotes exchange psychic or unexplained anti-life signals with each other, creating a type of a hive mind that keeps their swarm-like intelligence connected. Some even theorize that these connections work through quantum entanglement, enabling symbiotes to stay in sync over vast distances, potentially even galaxies and universes apart. Through this strange network, symbiotes might have a way of keeping track of their past hosts, possibly even learning from each other and evolving on a collective level. And lastly, when we talk about biology of the symbiotes, we have to talk about their reproduction. These symbiotes reproduce asexually by budding once per generation. Well, generally, though they can produce up to six seeds or offsprings. These offsprings share genetic memory with their parent, also sharing their strength and powers they have no social structure or concept of family and love. And so sometimes the offsprings even hate their parents as we can see in the case of Carnage and Venom. Yeah, also every successive generation is a magnitude more physically powerful than their parent. And so that's the strange biology of a symbiote like Venom. Now like, subscribe and we'll see you guys in the next video. Take care fam.